Okay, lecture one, history biology. Uh, this is just setting the background for cyanobacteria, HABs, and HABs in general. Um, the, actually, the, the term harmful algal bloom, or HAB, was coined by uh, a colleague of mine, Don Anderson, from Woods Hole, because he was primarily involved with marine HABs, but he actually helped establish the very first uh, congressional funding and the uh, various programs that the marine HAB people had. So he mentioned, he proposed the term harmful algal bloom probably 10 years ago now, and it's pretty much the one that has caught on, so hence there's where it comes from. Um, so anyway, let's move on. Um, we should keep in mind, especially with regards to the uh, cyanobacteria, that harmful algal blooms are not a new phenomenon. And I want to state that right up front. They've been around a long time. Obviously, algae are part of the geological record and history of uh, the Earth for a long time. Cyanobacteria have been around for at least three billion years. Um, there are interesting uh, anecdotal things in the geologic record that suggest that some of the mass die-offs in uh, aquatic organisms could have been actually due to cyanobacteria blooms. Of course, it's hard to prove that, but what you have are mass die-offs in the fossil record along with fossilized cyanobacteria cells is the, the main implication there. So they've been around, and there are um, some historical uh, anecdotes to that too. For example, this this statement by uh, Will Shakespeare that they're the sort of men whose visages do cream and mantle like a standing pond um, is probably a direct reference because there are, there are easily references in some of the medieval European literature to uh, green scums on moats and lakes and places like that. So we shouldn't think that uh, they're new. Of course, what we've done is created an environment in which they can now become more prevalent, more dominant, and more of a lasting nature. And it just so happens that the ones we've selected for with uh, you know the environmental things that have happened is that they're also ones that tend to be the ones producing toxin. So the factors in their formation uh, shouldn't be too unfamiliar to you. The urban agriculture industrial expansion is probably number one, and as a consequence of that, the nutrient input increases, especially nitrogen and phosphorus. Uh, the water use and hydrologic changes, diminished water flow and less mixing. If you think about it, many of our reservoirs uh, came in right around World War II, just before and just after. So they're now about you know, 70, 80 years old and natural aging of an open water body that has no natural sort of uh, checks and balances is bound to start becoming more nutrient rich and supporting blooms. And along with lakes that are also being impacted by our development and changes, those are uh, important factors. So we slow the water flow. Cyanobacteria love it when it's calm. And uh, mixing and stream flow or water flow, uh, flow through through a system is one of the better ways to actually manage and control blooms. Throw into that uh, you know, temperature increases with uh, our weather and climate. Uh, certainly, it's not a key factor in triggering blooms, but it's sort of a, uh, an interactive factor in the sense that um, you know, if you have warmer temperatures coming on earlier in the spring, staying later in the fall, uh, we've increased the time period in which we've optimized the growth conditions for cyanobacteria. So we can certainly claim that climate plays an interactive role. So as a consequence, these blooms become more common, more intense, and of longer duration, and that's really why most of you are here uh, today. So putting that into a cartoon, <coughs> we can throw in all of those factors, uh, nitrogen and phosphorus runoff from agriculture and cities and uh, forest practices, uh, reservoirs, uh, atmospheric uh, pollution, and then the return of that in the form of nitrogen and iron. Um, in our estuaries and coastal areas, uh, stratification, residence time are important. Whether we have turbulence or non-turbulence uh, are all factors 
So these are the kinds of things that we've made significant changes to, all of which uh, are conducive and cyanobacteria love it. In terms of the first published reference to cyanobacteria poisonings, we can go back to Australia and a, a note, a letter really, to the uh, journal Nature, uh, which was of course a British journal, in 1878, some, some sheep poisonings, and it wasn't from a scientist. George Francis was an Anglican priest who was also a naturalist. And uh, he noted the correlation between uh, these blooms in an estuary near Adelaide. And it turns out that it wasn't microcystis. In those cases, it was nodularia because it's a brackish water estuary near the sea. And nodularia turns out to produce a toxin similar to microcystin and was very much responsible then for these large-scale die-offs. Um, a colleague of mine, Jeff Codd, sort of as a historian, went back and read all of the early literature and has published a couple of papers on the history of, of uh, George Francis. He did a lot of other things besides minister. And uh, one of those papers is in the Transactions of the Royal Society of South Australia just last year. In the United States, we do have uh, reports of animal poisonings in the late 1800s. And they aren't necessarily in scientific literature. A lot of them simply got reported in newspapers. And uh, a couple of these, uh, these 1883 and 87 uh, papers were really animal poisonings in newspapers in, in Iowa and some of the lakes, uh, of course, of the prairie provinces of Canada. And that's really where it started because those lakes are shallow and naturally eutrophic and of course were heavily used by domestic animals. So those are our earlier reports. Uh, the first published reports were about 1950. Well, the, as I've already mentioned, the uh, Lake Erie and the return of cyanobacteria halves uh, in the 1990s, this is uh, out of the archives of Ohio State University, so that's one of those early blooms in the 70s. And um, in fact, we, the person's hand that is is still alive, so. <laughs> and then I threw in this just to show you and emphasize where cyanobacteria <coughs> terminology comes from. Cyano is, of course, blue, and blue-green algae, cyanobacteria. Uh, they were, of course, thought to be algae for a long time, and with the advent of the electron microscope and a guy named Roger Stanier, who was also at Berkeley, uh, he realized that these were prokaryotic organisms and published that and pushed for a lot of changes that eventually did happen with the uh, taxonomy of the group. Uh, but that's still evolving. I'll talk a bit about that later. But uh, he ended up at the Pasteur Institute in Paris, where a lot of his work is done. And in fact, that work continues in probably the largest collection in the world of uh, cultured cyanobacteria is at the Pasteur Institute. The US EPA has, in the last couple of years, started to look at uh, advisories by region. And so I, I managed to take this out of one of their websites. And just to show you, these. I'm not sure exactly how these done and how accurate they are, but for 2015, this is what they're reporting as have advisories by region. Um, <clears throat> and of course, it depends an awful lot like who's out there looking and who's bothering to report. So I'm sure this is probably on the low end, but it does give you a, a, a flavor, at least 2015 officially. Wayne? Yes? Sorry to interrupt. It, it actually was a student interns who did searches of online reporting. Oh, so it's okay. highly correlated with states that have programs, programs right. So the low numbers would kind of be states that might not have so many programs. Yeah. Okay, good. Thanks for that. Uh, cyanobacteria aren't the most fun thing to look at, although there's lots to uh, like about looking at them. Uh, unlike eukaryotic cells, they don't have a sexual cycle, life cycle, hence they don't produce exotic spores and reproductive structures and things that people like to look at under the microscope. 
They, they don't have flagella, so they don't move, which always uh, turns people off. You ought to have something moving under the microscope. But uh, this does illustrate their major shapes. So basically, they're unicells. Those unicells can clump and become a colony. So we have some colonies, these rounder um, ones. So this is a bigger colony. This is Microcystis aeruginosa, probably one of the biggest offenders there are. And of course, it's just thousands of individual cells. So each one of those little dots is a cell clumped together inside a slime sheath or a polysaccharide matrix. And they clump together. And the various shapes of these define the species within that genus. Um, so there's that. Then there's this colony, too, which is probably Coelospirium. Uh, and then, of course, if the cells align themselves in a straight line, they become a filament. So we have straight chain filaments, and then we have filaments that coil, some more like a bed spring, some more random coiling, and those all define different genera, different, even different families. So morphology has played a key factor in identification, which is, of course, one of the problems because different nutrient conditions, different lake conditions, different growth conditions, these morphologies can change and you can misidentify. But it's always a good way to start. So um, then within the, the straight chain, of course, if they clump together in a colony and twist and spiral, then of course that's a completely different organism. Uh, and then the other thing to note is that some of these filaments have specialized cells. So there's the normal vegetative cell, which just divides as binary fission, just like a bacteria cell. But they have special cells. In this case, this lighter cell in the center there is a heterocyst, which is a nitrogen-fixing cell. And if you remember, I said Lake Erie had a phanosomon and was a nitrogen fixer. It has heterocysts. And that's important because organisms makes them more competitive because they can grow in an environment low in nitrogen but it also indicates something about that environment. It means that nitrogen is limited in that environment. Whereas microcystis does not have any of those specialized nitrogen-fixing cells, so they're going to be growing in an environment richer in nitrogen. So you can tell quite a bit by the organism, a bit about its environment, and of course its morphology and identification. There's also another cell that's important along with the heterocyst, and it doesn't show up here, but I'll show it to you this afternoon in the live samples. And that's an achene, which is a sex, essentially an asexual spore, similar to bacterial spores. So the cell produces that toward the end of the growth season or when conditions become stressed for growth and drops those spores into the sediments, and those sediments can overwinter and regrow. So they're all different kinds of things. Uh, the main thing about the cyanobacteria is they're very, very good at responding to any kind of environmental condition. So we can find these growing almost anywhere. Anywhere you've got a little bit of light, you can find cyanobacteria. Well, I'm going to talk during the taxonomy a bit about other harmful algae as well. I'm going to set the stage here first. Uh, the marine ones, which came along first, are primarily in this grouping called dinoflagellates. We'll talk a bit about their taxonomy uh, in that session. But all of the various poisonings caused by marine algae, dinoflagellates, have developed acronyms or terms based largely on the kind of poisoning syndrome that they're responsible for. So the very first one, which we'll identify here in California, the paralytic shellfish poison, PSP, by definition defines a chemical grouping referred to as the saxotoxins. And we'll mention that again later. Then, of course, as people started looking more closely at some of these algae-based poisonings, they discovered that there were different symptoms, different syndromes, and hence different toxins, chemistry-wise. So along came things like diuretic shellfish poisoning, or DSP, neurotoxic shellfish poisoning, ciguatera sea fish food poisoning, and estuary associated syndrome. These define different dinoflagellates, different toxins, different chemistry, different toxicology, and to a certain extent, different vectoring into 
exposure to humans and animals. So the only one that's in the marine environment that's different from the dinoflagellates producing toxicity is this diatom, which is relatively new. It's only about 15 years into the literature. This was based on some poisonings that occurred in Canada, and uh, it involved essentially the loss of memory along with some other problems. And it then became known as amnesic shellfish poisoning. And that's caused by a diatom. I'll mention that a little bit later too. Now, um, this one is now responsible for major bloom situation and poisonings off the California coast. This, the blob that you had last year, the year before, uh, is this diatom producing the ASB toxin. Yeah. That was the one that closed the crab season? Right, oh. yeah. Um, this is the one that closes our shellfish uh, collection for the razor clams all up and down the coast in Oregon, Washington as well. So it's the primary one closing. PSP a little bit, but mostly it's, it's this one. And then cyanobacteria toxin poisoning, which is the main topic of this, so I'll, I'll talk more about later. And then there's one other one that, uh, interestingly enough, is starting to show up here in California a bit more. Last year in the workshop down in, in San Marcos, a person brought in samples, and it had this golden algae called Primnesium parvum in it. Um, I don't think anyone's done any toxicity testing here yet, but curiously enough, this time, just last week at San Marcos, the sample was brought in and it was full of Primnesium as well. <coughs> so, Primnesium is interesting because it's more of a brackish water, so it kind of implies that you've got salinity increases in that water supply, even though it might be a freshwater lake. Where it first showed up was in Texas, and they were uh, trying to recover oil from oil wells, pumping brine into those wells, and when that brine came back up, it flowed into rivers, it salinified the rivers, and uh, the primnesium grew, and it produces a hemolytic cytotoxin, which uh, gets through the gills and essentially leads to lysis of the blood. So these fish would bleed around the gills and suffocate and die by the tens of thousands. And uh, that is a sort of control, but now, of course, you start looking for it, you find it in other places as well. So you have that here in, in California, too, to amuse you. I don't know any, again, you shouldn't assume that it's producing a toxin, um, but it's fairly easy to test for because all you need is a little bit of blood and a few, set, a few cells of that sample, just put them together if the cells lice, assuming you maintain the osmotic conditions, uh, you've probably got that hemolytic cytotoxin. So the bioactive metabolites of cyanobacteria, um, Cyanobacteria may not look like much in terms of their morphology, but their biochemistry is totally amazing. Uh, they're equally um, productive of <coughs> beneficial compounds as they are non-beneficial compounds. In some cases, even better than fungi in producing antibiotics. So the, there's what I refer to then as a grouping of bioactive metabolites of cyanobacteria, cytotoxins, or toxins with cytotoxic or cellular effects. So that could be antibiotics, antifungal, so on and so forth. The ones that we're more concerned with with water supplies and human and animal exposure then are the more acute and acute lethal and chronic biological effects from these toxins or cyanotoxins. So I like to just point out that there are other beneficial compounds. And those beneficial compounds can be in the form of uh, antiviral, antibacterial, antifungal, antialgal, antiworms or helminth, antihelminthic, or even anti-tumor compounds, cardioactive, anti-inflammatory, antimitotic, and even some very important sunscreen compounds. Uh, this uh, sunscreen compound is being developed by a colleague of mine from Phanazomenon, actually, from Klamath Lake. Uh, it contains these compounds. You can make some very effective sunblock um, materials. So there are beneficial uh, compounds. But when it comes to those toxins of concern, 
there are really three groupings. They have a neurotoxic effect, that is, they affect nerve conduction, and typically animals that are poisoned would die from respiratory arrest if it's acute lethal, and it can be literally within minutes. Um, the hepatotoxins, the ones that tend to be more of an issue, uh, as the name implies, they affect primarily the liver, and those would be the microcystins, which we'll talk about more. And uh, the direct cause of death there is that they affect the cellular architecture. The, uh, the webbing that literally gives the shape to the liver cell. And uh, they inhibit something called protein phosphatase, which that cytoskeleton becomes disrupted and the cell loses its shape. So if you can visualize your liver suddenly starting to lose its shape, it no longer can filter blood as it's supposed to do and the blood pools in the liver and the liver swells up and uh, the animal dies from liver failure or hemorrhagic shock. So the um, poisonings, the human poisonings that I investigated in Brazil in the mid-90s were largely due to the hepatotoxins and 130 people died from liver failure or hemorrhagic shock. Then there's a group of compounds called the dermatoxins, which are really contact irritants, but they're also skin tumor promoters, and those are largely marine. These are, uh, we'll talk a bit about, more about them, but they're not so much of a freshwater issue, but they're a marine issue, tropical marine. So the routes of exposure for these various organisms and their toxins, as you might expect, anything that has to do with water. Okay. So surface drinking water is of prime concern. You want to keep these organisms and their toxins out of water. And if you can't, you at least have to get them to levels that are uh, totally acceptable and safe. And there are some numbers that are out there for that purpose. Uh, recreational waters are probably where I would see most of the actual acute poisonings take place because the, obviously the levels are higher and the exposure is higher. Uh, there are issues with the food web, uh, not so much as there is with food web concentrations of toxins in the marine environment. In the freshwater, we do have good examples. California has a good one, although it's sort of freshwater and marine. Those are the sea otters that died from microcystin in Monterey Bay a few years ago. Uh, in that case, microcystis was growing in Pinto Lake, flushed into Monterey Bay was taken into shellfish and the sea otters ate the shellfish and the poison. In fact, the very first uh, workshop I did at Santa Cruz was right in the middle of that. I went down to the lab um, and looked at slides and it was clear to me that this was a liver problem, which was subsequently shown to be the case. So, so there are some food web issues, but they're not as significant as they are with the marine toxins. There's a small concern in a study through dietary supplements. How many people eat blue-green algae? Nobody can't afford it. Anyway, uh, there is a quite an industry of harvesting either spirulina, of course, from here, uh, down in the uh, Imperial Valley, or uh, phanazomalon from Klamath Lake. It's uh, the other source of uh, dietary supplements. And hemo, hemodialysis, I put in here because this is the case that I investigated in Brazil where you have a water supply, the water supply has the algae, the water treatment plant doesn't completely remove the algae or the toxin. The toxin, uh, the water is taken into a dialysis center where people are receiving kidney dialysis and the water is not purified, hence people get dialyzed against the toxin and die from liver failure and hemorrhagic shock. So, these are some of the sources of exposure. Um, there is a bit of a concern, uh, probably under food web, for using irrigated waters that contain blooms on crops. Um, I don't think that that's so much of an issue. It's actually more of an issue to the crop itself because microcystins actually are toxic to leafy vegetables. So um, it's hard for me to imagine enough of a amount being concentrated in vegetables to be an issue because they're not going to concentrate them like shellfish do or fish. But there is a bit of exposure possibly from that route. 
So the target organisms of cyanobacteria in water supplies in the water environment would be anything you can think of that has some exposure to that water, including wild birds and fish and invertebrates and aquacultured fish and invertebrates as well. Uh, striped bass used to be, or still is, an aquacultured uh, industry here in, in uh, California. And the very first time I was involved with aquacultured fish was the striped bass die-offs that were occurring here in California. This has been 20 years ago, but um, again, it's where these were microsystem exposures. And then subsequent to that, there's something called net and liver disease in salmon from salmon rearing farms in uh, Washington, places like that in particular. Uh, those net pens, of course, are enclosed and trapped, and they're often placed in bays and estuaries that are conducive to the formation of the cyanobacteria, and the smolts that are placed into those nets haven't figured out what to eat yet, and they often eat what's on those net uh, growths and um, are intoxicated and die from from microcystin. Water users, uh, of course, domestic and wild animals, humans, and that's where I put in the agriculture exposure. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, can you go into that a little bit more, the agriculture exposure? I mean, you were talking about the food web and the otters, but you didn't really say anything about the agriculture. Um, yeah, there are a few papers. Um, basically, if you're using a, a reservoir water supply that's got a bloom in it and you're irrigating vegetables, then you're going to expose those vegetables to cyanobacteria. Um, what I've seen, actually I've seen some, you know, all plants have stomates that they take and exchange gases through. And cells can actually get into the, in, it's not just washing the vegetable, because you can actually have cells trap themselves inside the vegetable to a certain, not very much, but they contain small levels of, of toxin. And the toxicity that I've seen in the literature has more to do with the fact that it affects photosynthesis and you get a sort of chlorotic um, die-off of the vegetable tissue. Uh, I've never seen any vegetable that has concentrated enough that would exceed an intake level that is relative to say drinking water. Is that? And it's only with, been with microcystin that I've seen it. It could be other toxins, but I've never seen it. So there are some papers out about that as well? There are some. There are a few. There's actually a fairly new one just a month or so ago. Okay. If you email me, I'll try and put you in contact with that. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Is there concern about people eating fish that are living in um, a reservoir lake that has high levels of bacteria? Right. Um, Could you repeat that? Sure. The question was, what about fish? and? you know, fish exposure to presumably the fish flesh that you eat. Um, the answer that I have seen, that, well, first of all, there are states that have set guidelines for fish consumption just in the same way they've set fish consumption for pesticides and other contaminants, like Lake Erie. There's actually an intake, on, if you go to the Lake Erie website, the International Joint Commission, there's actually a list there of recommended intake. And it's about the same level, 100 grams a day or something. I'm not quoting the exact, but, but yes. The issue is, though, I don't think fish are concentrating the toxin. Just like vegetables, they're going to die <laughs> uh, before they concentrate excessive amounts like the marine shellfish. The thing about marine shellfish is that they're passive. They're, they aren't affected by those toxins. So they can concentrate the toxin to levels that if you eat a shellfish, you're poisoned. That's not going to happen with fish. So it's possible to intake microcystin, but it's more in how you clean the fish. You know, if there are cultures of people who eat the liver or eat the roe or consume some of the internal organs of the fish, they're, more, they're going to certainly have a higher level of toxin intake. But if you eviscerate, wash the fish, it's going to be very rare that you would ever exceed any of those guidelines. So, yes, when people, you, I know you're, you know, people ask you, can I eat the fish? You know, it's always tough because you're going to say, well, how are you going to treat the fish? <laughs> as long as they eviscerate it, wash it well, um, it should be no problem. Now, if the fish is ill or dying, then you've got another, you know, you wouldn't want to eat it anyway. But, um, does that answer your question? 
Yeah. So why aren't we seeing hundreds of thousands of water birds dying? Well, we do. The question is, why don't we see lots of water birds dying? Um, we do. The historical die-offs from those early cases are migratory birds coming in, landing on a lake, and 10,000 birds being hit the next day. Maybe we've just got less birds flying in the flyway, and we see dead birds, but we don't, we don't correlate them with a large event. Um, but certainly, birds are affected. I've analyzed bird tissue, and you know, it was clearly a toxic level of microcystin or anatoxin. They're all affected by it. Um, but they, you know, birds like fish are fairly tolerant to those toxins too. They're not like dogs and mammals. But it does happen. Uh, we just don't see it as much as we used to. Anything else? Good questions. Or did I finish this or not? Oh, I don't think I finished this. <laughs> the cyanotoxins, again, we're not going to talk chemistry, but I want to mention that those neurotoxins are referred to as anatoxin A, anatoxin AS, uh, at least the alkaloid toxins, and cylindrospermopsin, and those are the organisms that we've identified. We're going to be seeing some anabina today and some of uh, a bit of planktothrix even, uh, so you'll see some of these key producers. But these are the alkaloid toxins, these three, and then this one, the paralytic shellfish toxins, the saxitoxins. Uh, there's quite a few organism genera that produce these uh, PSP toxins or saxitoxins. There's about 25 different group, chemical groups, chemical types of the PSP. They're actually called PSTs now, paralytic shellfish toxins, because there's so many of them. Saxitoxin is just one of them, but that was the original one. The, um, the group of organisms that produce it is quite widespread, and I'm a little surprised that we don't see it more frequently in the U.S., but it's more of an issue in Australia, South America, Europe. We just haven't seen it very much here in the United States. In fact, there are more genera of cyanobacteria that produce these paralytic shellfish toxins than there are marine dinoflagellates that produce the toxin, which is curious. Then these contact irritants, the alkaloids that I mentioned, the dermatoxins, that would be these guys. It's lingviotoxin and so on. And of course, lingvia, which is a benthic cyanobacteria. Another question? Just real quick, the paralytic shellfish toxins, are those mostly marine? Because they usually grow out in marine environments. Yeah. But a lot of those... Um, well, these are all freshwater. Yeah, I'm big. I've seen those. Yeah, that's what I... I so is it, is it a problem in freshwater as well, or is it usually... Well, it does occur. As I said, I'm surprised we don't see more of the PST poisonings in the United States because we have all these organisms. But whenever I've tested them, the first one I found that was positive for the PSTs was actually an anabina in Oregon uh, 10 or 15 years ago. Um, and I've seen some positives from Texas, but very few. But yes, these are all freshwater. This is historically a marine toxin, but there are more freshwater cyanobacteria that produce the, than there are marine dinoflagellates in terms of species. And in fact, the genetics of this toxin would suggest that the marine organisms, dinoflagellates, got the genes for the production of the toxin from cyanobacteria. So, that's interesting. Um, what, so what are the symptoms of the, of the ESTs? I'm going to talk about that in the taxonomy. Maybe you could wait. Okay. But, but again, these are neurotoxins, so the toxicity is going to be respiratory failure. The cyclic peptides, the ones that are of primary interest, the microcystins. Um, the problem with microcystins, while just like with saxitoxin, you identify one and you think you've got it, and then you start looking and you find more. There are now about 120 analogs of microcystin and we only have 
the tests set up for maybe a half a dozen. Now those are the key ones, maybe 90% of them, but you can certainly have situations where some of the other analogs, chemical analogs is what I'm referring to, uh, of microsystems. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. I'll show you some quick chemistry. But again, quite a number producing them. Of course, microcystis is the main one, which is the first one identified. But our anabinas and our nostocs and our planktothrix and so on. The Synecococcus parenthesis marine is really uh, relevant here in California as well because your uh, hypersaline you know, salt and sea uh, produces fairly significant blooms of Synecococcus, which produce microcystin, which were probably linked, certainly directly and indirectly, to the mass bird die-offs that you were experiencing in, uh, in the Salton Sea um, in the 90s. Um, same type of, of effect. So the microcystins are cyclic peptides. Nodularins are cyclic peptides. These are seven-membered rings. This is a five-membered ring, but they have basically the same effect. They're liver toxins. And finally, because all cyanobacteria are prokaryotic, they're like bacteria, they're gram-negative bacteria, they have a cell wall that is composed partially of lipopolysaccharide, or LPS. And if you're familiar with LPS producing bacteria, they are referred to as endotoxins. So you can have endotoxic shock in the hospital environment when you're receiving a saline solution that's contaminated with a bacterial endotoxin. Same thing here. Some of the cyanobacterial endotoxin, or LPS, shows a bit of activity, but it's not a significant issue. But it has to be listed. Does that make sense? These are, again, remember, we call them blue-green algae, but they're really blue-green bacteria. They are gram-negative bacteria that are much bigger than most bacteria and are green and photosynthesized and have chlorophyll A, but they're bacteria. And if I haven't said it, you know, being three billion years old, they were responsible for the oxygen in our atmosphere. They were the first organism producing oxygen as a byproduct. So the, roughly the rankings then of importance and health significance for the cyanotoxins, we certainly list microcystins first because they're the most common widespread poisonings anywhere around the world. Followed by the anatoxins, some significant animal poisonings there. Followed by cylindrospermopsin. Now cylindrospermopsin is interesting because it's largely a semi-tropical, tropical organism and it showed up in Australia first and the toxin was identified from material. And the human poisonings documented from cylinders from oxen are all in Australia. But about 20 years ago, they started to show up in blooms in Florida. And the genetic evidence would suggest that they're invasive from South America, where they also were. So we first started looking at them in the Midwest, and they shouldn't have appeared, but they were. There were some water supplies in Indiana and Iowa, and the toxin was present. And um, now I see it in positive samples in Oregon, probably 10 or 15 years ago, first time. So this organism, Cylindrospermopsis, seems to be adapting more to either our climate shift or the fact that we're not so <coughs> tropical. So that's an interesting one. And it's also, in terms of the advisory numbers that the US EPA has put out, they've only done this for microcystins and cylinders for mopsin. Uh, so they're the only two that they've set guideline levels for. Anyway, uh, lingvia toxins, nodularin, saxitoxins. And this one in black, BMAA, I'll mention a little bit more. This is the new one that's a big question. Uh, cyanobacteria, some cyanobacteria produce this compound. It's a small amino acid, it's a neurotoxin, so it's a neurotoxic amino acid, and it's been linked to Alzheimer's, ALS um, syndrome. Still an awful lot of question about that, but I do list it. 
and I'll show you the chemistry on it. So, quick chemistry purview, <clears throat> and then we'll end this session. The um, neurotoxins, the anatoxin A, here's the chemistry here. Uh, the interesting thing here, look at this as an eight-membered <coughs> ring. It's, it's a neurotoxin, it's an alkaloid by virtue of having this nitrogen, so alkaloids are nit you know, nitrogen-based compounds. Uh, this eight-membered ring is different from something that's a seven-membered ring that you should maybe be familiar with. L-cocaine is a seven-membered ring. The very first synthetic route to anatoxin A was via L-cocaine. So uh, it has none of the effects of L-cocaine, by the way, but it is, in its realm right, a very potent neurotoxin. Anatoxin AS right here is an, al is an alkaloid as well, uh, but it's also an organophosphate. It has this phos organophosphate ring or structure. And um, being an organophosphate is just like an organophosphate pesticide is its toxicity. So you couldn't tell the difference between this toxicity and an OP pesticide <coughs> poisoning toxicity. Um, I could give you a two-hour lecture on toxicology, but that's not today, so we'll just move on. Then, of course, saxotoxins are neurotoxins, too. And there are, again, you die from respiratory arrest. But all of these, this toxin and this toxin and this toxin, affect different parts of the nerve conduction pathway that leads eventually to nerve blockage, which leads to muscle inactivity, which leads to difficulty breathing and all your muscle functions and you expire by various different ways, but mostly respiratory arrest. The liver toxins, the microcystins, called hepatotoxins, are these cyclic peptides and being a cyclic peptide is rather important because uh, there are some very important cyclic peptides. Some of the antibiotics are cyclic peptides. This one, however, is not an antibiotic in any way. <clears throat> Instead, it's a liver toxin. The seven-member ring, so here's seven. <clears throat> um, the R's and the R1 and the R2 um, and the Z and the X in this structure indicate where you can place different amino acids. Hence, you can get 120 different analogs. Almost any amino acid that you could chemically place in there would still give you this activity like a microcystin. So the main one, we name these by those variable amino acids of Z and X. So microcystin LR, microcystin with leucine and arginine, would define one. And that's the one that I worked first with. It's one of the more common ones. It's one of the more toxic ones but almost anything you could put in there, <clears throat> LA, RR, RY, you know, tyrosine, arginine, leucine, valine, just keep going. And that gives you then those many, many different analogs. Fortunately, this part of the structure is the same, and that seems to be important for its activity. This is a hydrophobic uh, with that ring at the end, and that's what penetrates into your liver cell. It also means that if we have a test for that part of the molecule, then we have a test for all of the microsystems. And so the, the recent ELISAs that are out there, the enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay kits that you might buy, are targeted through this. So they should do a pretty good job of detecting all microsystems, although they've never all been tested, so that's not for sure. Um, the original ELISAs, antibodies that were raised against microcystin were targeted to different parts of that molecule and so they weren't necessarily always good for all different microcystins. So, well, that's microcystin story, as much as I can tell you at present. And then the related one, the pentapeptide, the nodularin, is not so much of an issue, but notice that it's a five-membered ring. But again, being a cyclic peptide and having this structure right here, which is called ADDA abbreviated, 
is where its activity resides, so it has a similar effect to microcystin. But this is more of a tumor promoter. Than my, both of these are also tumor promoters. Um, which is why some of the guidelines take into account the fact that they are tumor promoters, not just liver toxins. But this is a more active tumor promoter than this microsystem is. Produced only by nodularia, and there are maybe half a dozen analogs known for this one. Solendospermopsin, um, which is the other one on the EPA list for guidelines, looks like this. This is Solendospermopsis. Uh, and it's a guanidine ring. Uh, it's called a, um, an alkaloid because of those nitrogen parts of the molecule, but it's not a neurotoxin. It's more of a cytotoxin. And it targets primarily the kidney but it also targets the liver. It has a, a dual toxicity effect, which makes it difficult to identify. Um, but it's, it's an interesting molecule in that respect. The toxicology of this one is not nearly as well known as it is for the microsystems. But there are ELISA kits, test kits for screening this compound. So you can test for it. The BMAA that I mentioned, beta and methyl amino L alanine, this very simple amino acid with a very interesting potent activity. So it's called a neurotoxic amino acid. Possibly linked cause slash with neurodegenerative disease, similar to ALS or the Gehrig's disease. Produced by several groups of cyanobacteria, but in very small amounts. And this one must be magnified a huge amount of time. So this one has to be magnified through the food chain in order to have a toxic effect, which is how it was first identified. It was first identified in uh, the island of Guam in the South Pacific because indigenous peoples there love to eat flying bats. And bats eat cycad seeds, and cycads have symbiotic cyanobacteria in their roots called nostoc, and that nostoc produces BMAA. The BMAA is translocated, concentrated in the seeds. The bats ate the seeds, and, and people ate the bats. <laughs> and over years, it took years for the disease to show itself. And, um, but it was established, it was proven. It's one of the more interesting ethnobotanical studies of biomagnification. And it wasn't, though, until the 90s that that was linked to the cyanobacteria in the roots as producing the BMAA. So then people went out and said, well, other cyanobacteria should produce it. And you do find small amounts of it. But as of yet, I don't call it a major health risk. But there is a test kit and a lot of for it if you decide that this is something that you have to, should be testing for. So there's a quick toxicology um, going to uh, tidy this up. The, the, the Safe Water Drinking Act uh, that Congress established was 1996. And um, in the, the first one in 1998 listed algae in their toxins, but didn't really say much about them. In 2004, it also included the algae. So the the Safe Water Act, the Canada Contaminant List, does list algal toxins, but very little is mentioned as to how you deal with it, what you're supposed to recognize about it. That's now just evolving with regards to the EPA. So the priority listing then, again, as I said, microcystins, cylindrospermopsin, anatoxin A, and saxotoxin. And as the EPA goes, these are the only two that there are guidelines set for. Other countries have guidelines for anatoxin A. Australia was the very first country to establish guidelines and regulations. And when we sat down with the World Health Organization to set World Health Organization guidelines, we relied heavily on Australia's guidelines. So some of those original Australian publications are available pretty much online and include the following listings, mostly out of the National Health and Medical Research Council. 
And our WHO book published in 1998, or 1999, the meetings we had were in 1998, which if you remember was about the time uh, Soviet Union, shortly after the Soviet Union fell apart, <coughs> East Germany became, West Germany became Germany. So we had all our meetings in East Germany, which was fun. And that book came out of that. There's supposed to be a second edition, which they've never managed to get the funding together to put out. And it's largely been superseded by other publications, so I don't think we'll ever see it. But this is all available online, and you can download that entire book still. The uh, U.S. National Plan for Santa Habs began around 19, or sorry, 2005. We had a, a meeting in, um, in North Carolina at Research Triangle Park, and a publication in 2008, which was almost 1,000 pages, sort of sets the stage for the U.S. effort with cyanobacteria. And that's all downloadable, too, from that symposium website from 2008. Ken Hudnell was the editor of that. The uh, Freshwater Harmful Lago Boom legislation website that was set up is not really updated much. That's all folded now into the US EPA's websites. So um, I'm not even sure that link is active, but that's where it started. The Freshwater Harmful Lago Bloom Research and Control Act of 2010 was passed by the House of Representatives in 2010, but not by the Senate. And it was eventually folded into the marine harmful bloom. So all harmful algae now are referred to as the Harmful Algal Bloom and Hypoxia Research and Control Act, acronym BARCA, uh, <coughs> finally passed, and the new one's out, 2015. Some other useful citations. This is the citation for the Brazil human poisonings that is environmental health perspective we published. Uh, Ken's book, again, here's the website for that symposium. And more recently, just in uh, this year, two th April 2016, a special edition of Harmful Algae on the Global Expansion of Harmful Algal Blooms uh, is useful. Unfortunately, being a, a Journal, you either have to have access to the journal uh, or you pay for it. It's not free like these others. Uh, but anyway, it's there. And there's also a special edition of toxins as well, journal toxins, <coughs> harmful algal bloom, and public health progress in the current. And this is, this Leslie Dianglada is the uh, person in the US EPA who is the HAB coordinator for the US EPA. She's the one who puts out the the newsletters and the webinars and all of that. And so uh, this is largely her effort along with Elizabeth Hilburn, who's also with the US EPA <coughs> in Research Triangle Park. Lorraine Backer has been involved with freshwater hats for many, many years. She's with CDC and is responsible for that CDC program that the states had. All right. And these are some of those US EPA recent releases, 2015. These are all on those websites for the US EPA. So again, there's lots of literature out there now. And of course, California's adding to that as well. And we've got lots to do to keep you busy on the web. <clears throat> I wanted to quickly mention this what has pushed the EPA to new heights of interest was really uh, this 2011 bloom that I showed you earlier uh, of microcystis. And more recently, the drinking water event in Toledo of 2014, where the Toledo water supply was shut down because of a breakthrough of microcystin into the drinking water which measured it around three parts per billion and the headline is one part per billion. So they responded appropriately, but there was uh, a lot of issues. Uh, it shouldn't and didn't need to happen. Uh, but the Toledo water supply, uh, the Toledo water treatment plant is a second world war treatment plant. So uh, that's kind of all I need to say. <coughs> 
So that's some of the text. You can find this online too. Now we have regular meetings for cyanobacteria. Unfortunately, most of you being state, you don't get foreign travel. Uh, but the effort at international meetings for harmphilology began at my university back in 1980 from the US EPA. And then the next one wasn't until 1993 in, in uh, the UK. But since then, we've had fairly regular meetings. And the most recent one is going to be this fall, October, in uh, Wuhan, China, where I've done a lot of work as well. And China, at this point, has the biggest, the most significant program in cyanobacteria. They spend, uh, on one lake alone, Tai Wu, they're spending $25 billion to clean up this lake. And there's hundreds and hundreds of programs in China uh, doing primary research on cyanobacteria halves. So if you ever could get to Wuhan, and Wuhan in October is not too hot, it's not as hot as it is here in Sacramento, um, it would be a very worthwhile meeting. Okay, 